There we go. All right. Um, one of the first things I learned in my education was nothing about us without us when you're doing community-based participatory research. Uh, so I'm going to actually turn it to Tanisha to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Tanisha. Thank you, Hillary, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Tanisha Armstrong. I'm happy to be here presenting today along with my fellow patient professors. Um, Patients Professors Academy was an exciting and is an exciting opportunity for those who are interested in participatory research uh, and really interesting for me as a patient who had to learn to advocate for myself, uh, for my late husband, and for some family members along the way. So I think that um, our voices are important. I think that it is wonderful to be valued, and I look forward to participating today. Thanks so much, Tanisha. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hillary Edwards. As Faith mentioned, I'm one of the directors at the Patients Program at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Uh, and I have the distinct pleasure to run our Patients Professors Academy, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later in this presentation. But first I wanna talk about what started the Patients Program here 10 years ago. Next slide, please. Uh, so in 2013, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality uh, funded the patients program through a $5 million uh, five-year award to really encourage patients, caregivers, and other collaborators from the community to be involved in every aspect of the research process. It was a building capacity award in patient-centered outcomes research about the study design. So how do you plan a study? Incorporating the community and patient voice. How do you do it? How do you conduct the study? again, incorporating and valuing the patient voice. And then how do you share those results back to the community at large, whether it's the individuals who participated in your study or a broader audience who can take the work that you've done and really make a difference as people are making decisions in their healthcare and in their lives. Next slide, please. So our vision is that patients and stakeholders are heard, inspired, and empowered to co-develop PCOR with us. And we do that first by listening to patient voices so that we ask relevant questions and we align research priorities with the values of patients and communities. How do we transform research to make it more relevant and patient-centered? And then, of course, and what I'm so excited to share with uh, my esteemed panel today is how we train patients, stakeholders, and researchers to co-develop PCOR, whether it's through here in partnership at the University of Maryland or uh, in other local and community-based organizations. Next slide, please. So our research is sort of bounded within this 10-step framework for continuous engagement. And it's not just one project, right? We had a five-year, $5 million grant that's now grown to have over a dozen continuous research projects within our uh, portfolio at any one time. Uh, this slide has sort of a smattering of what our portfolio currently looks like. Uh, but what I'm most excited again to talk about is our academy. Next slide. So we, three years ago started the Patients Professors Academy, which is a five-week virtual program that brings together people from across the United States, whether they identify as patients, caregivers, government representatives, researchers, industry, um, to learn about patient-centered and community-engaged research skills together. Uh, we have an incredible group of patients professors, those who have partnered with our program for many years, uh, as well as other clinical researchers who have been funded through PCORI or other uh, patient-centered outcomes research uh, initiatives. And they co-lead seminars throughout those five weeks. And really it's about sharing the learning and promising practices together. And we do that in order to increase diversity, recruitment and retention in clinical trials and other uh, research initiatives, provide value to both patient and research communities through mutually beneficial partnerships, and also uh, build trustworthiness by ensuring that patients are integral to the research decisions, again, throughout that 10-step uh, framework for continuous engagement. Next slide. So uh, again, my four colleagues, Brian, Tanisha, Jenny, and Donald serve as patients professors. Uh, they have their own lived experiences and the expertise that they bring to the table um, help us identify in collaboration what's important to the communities that we want to engage in different projects, how to best engage different communities, because again, 
a community or a patient is not a monolith, right? They're multidimensional. And how do we translate and disseminate that critical information to patients? And every day I continue to learn um, from our esteemed professors uh, about how we can do research better. Next slide. Um, and so we have these two quotes here from both the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore, as well as one of our recent graduates. But instead, I'm actually going to ask, uh, who do I get to pick on first today? I'm going to ask Donald if he can share a little bit uh, about his experiences in the Patients Professors Academy for a couple of minutes. So, Donald, do you mind sharing how you got involved with us and, and sort of what you've learned since then? No, no, not at all, Hillary. First, I want to say good afternoon to everyone who has joined and if you are in one of those time zones where it's still morning then congratulations and good morning to you um i i became a a student at the patient professors program um early on i think i may have been in the first cohort of the patient professors program and it was before it was almost a prerequisite to my community health worker certification and I landed at uh, patient professors because I needed to advocate for my own health. I had just newly been diagnosed HIV positive. I had just recently um, began medication assistance, substance abuse disorder. And my mother lost, I lost my mother to a fentanyl overdose. So by the time I had landed in the patient professors program, it was almost as a refuge and a way for me to find out a little bit more about me and how I could better help the community. And it, um, patient professors program led me to understand that there was an opportunity for community members who lived in my zip code to not just be looked at as research uh, study patients, but to really participate in the design and the implementation of research. Before I got here, I knew nothing about design, implementation, um, the theory of change. Um, I didn't know any of that until I started to really buckle down and learn from the patient professors program and how all of that, those things I just mentioned could help my community. So it was really not just about me, but it was really about getting in there and finding out how I could help people in my community from walking down the road that I was about to travel as newly diagnosed with uh, a condition that was highly stigmatized. And I needed to, to arm myself with a toolbox and a toolkit to just navigate through my own care and learn how to advocate for myself. So that's how I became involved in uh, the Patient Professors Academy, and it has been life-changing. Thanks so much, Donald, and looking forward to hearing from our others uh, as well about their journeys both before, during, and after participating in our academy. Uh, and as Faith mentioned, please feel free to chat in the um, in the chat box, any questions, uh, maybe your outcomes or things that you're hoping to get from today's session uh, around continuous engagement, uh, and we'll certainly address them either through the presentation or we have time set aside for the Q&A. Next slide. So we've talked about continuous engagement, or at least I've said that's the foundation of the patients program here at the University of Maryland. Uh, and the next couple of slides, we're really gonna talk about why 10 steps and why continuous engagement is important and also explain the difference between patient-centered outcomes research and maybe community-based participatory research and what is patient-centered versus patient-targeted practices. Um, and so feel free again to use the chat if you have specific thoughts on what the differences might be between patient-centered and patient-targeted practices. Um, but I wanted to ask, let's see, I'll ask Jenny, if she doesn't mind, um, sharing what she thinks uh, some of the differences may be between patient-centered versus patient-targeted. Jenny, what are your thoughts? Hi, everyone. Thank you, uh, Hillary. Um, so patient-centered, now, you know, my history as a nurse and a quality director, I lived for patient-centered, um, uh, you know, activities. And that was the buzzword of my career. And then I entered into the PPA, the, the Patients Professors um, Program, and then it became patient, uh, you know, targeted practices um, and a mix of the two. Uh, what I find is that the patient needs to be the utmost 
in the center of every discussion and they must have a voice in their care. And in order to know and be fully informed um, and to provide um, you know, a full consent of that care and have the option to not have a treatment and or uh, you know a certain um, element of care um, and have a voice in saying that as well. I'll pass it back to you, Helen. Thanks, Jenny. Um, and one of the things that's really important and what we've certainly learned over the decade of work that we've done is about trust and trustworthiness, both in the medical system as well as in research. Next slide, please. So even if you are someone who has seen the same primary care provider for 10 years, there are things that can happen on your medical journey that can make you question whether or not your relationship is authentic and in your best interest. And one of the things that we've learned through patient-centered outcomes research and community-based participatory research is that trust must be built and it must be fostered. You can't just have a transactional, we had a great meeting, hooray, like we're gonna be best friends forever in this research capacity but it needs to be built and maintained uh, and maintained through pre-engagement and then continuous community partnering. And so on this slide, we have a diagram of first what, identifying what is mutually beneficial for both community-based partners, as well as an academic institution or a clinical institution. How do you partner in a way that again, maintains that uh, mutual benefit, even if you have maybe different goals uh, across your organizations? And then how do you explain what you're doing together and for each other? Then you're going to do it and then you're going to update what you've learned, right? Because we all continue to grow and change. Um, and certainly for anyone who's been part of a, a research partnership over the pandemic, uh, you know, we've had to make changes in order to continue to thrive. And so the goal of trust and trustworthiness is to foster full and meaningful partnering between researchers and participants. And those may be community leaders, again, they may be patients, they could be government agencies that you're trying to collaborate with in terms of changing policy, all throughout the research process. And for anyone who's done research knows it's not just a single dimension, there are many steps to making sure that you are successful in your research project. Next slide. So a little over 10 years ago, uh, Dr. Daniel Mullins, who is the executive director of the Patients Program and faculty here at the University of Maryland, developed a 10-step framework for continuous engagement. Next slide. Um, and it's a two-pager that was published in JAMA, but I think the most important part is really in this diagram about patient engagement as the guide. And so this framework spans the entire life cycle of a research project from coming up with the research question and the type of design that you want to do that can really get the answers that you're seeking uh, to then how to participate and monitor a study to sharing the solutions and the results that you found. Each of those stages has different purposes, advantages, disadvantages, and implications for time and resources. And nonetheless, having a patient voice or a or community leader voice involved in that process is critical to make sure that it's resonant with the communities, the patients, the populations you're trying to serve. Uh, so uh, I'm now gonna ask um, Brian to talk a little bit about he might've been involved in a couple of these steps or where you've been most excited to put your energy um, in terms of the 10 step framework, Brian. Thanks, Chloe. Thanks, Hillary. So before the, before joining, before joining the Patients Process Academy, um, one thing I did notice that I didn't notice is that research uh, wasn't um, developed for, for patients like myself. I always thought that that research was traditional way of just getting information from patients and that's about it, but not really so much about engaging with patients like myself. Um, ever since joining the academy, I did learn that research can be driven another way around to really empower patients' voices like myself, um, and also really just start sharing information um, based on research outcomes that really patients really generally care about. Um, for example, um, one thing I did notice under my my work with with the Spine Association is that is that research can be uh, accessible and also flexible and receptible in ways that patients can can truly understand and comprehend and can uh, gain access to the information that they need to improve their their quality of healthcare or care. Uh, patients like myself, so that's really really critical. 
uh, that I found along the step of the way of the journey is that patients' voices are often get left behind, but at the same time, um, they can get empowered by by giving that voice to patients, right? Um, getting access to information, being being accessible, being accessible and flexible to patients' needs, and partnering with patients or communities really takes time. It really takes time, as you mentioned. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. And that really goes through continuing engaging and partnering with patients and communities. Um, and even communities that are already um, marginalized or underserved. Um, so, yeah. So, back to you, Hillary. Thanks, Brian. And I see Donald also has uh, some thoughts on the 10 step framework. Donald? Yeah, thanks, Hillary. Just to, to add to what Brian said, you know, when I first started to work in community participatory research, I heard a, a researcher say directly to me that they did not think that the community should be involved in every step of um, the research continuum because it would water down the science is the term that was used. And, you know, in this 10-step framework work, there are certain steps that, you know, does not require a lot of time and, and a lot of knowledge. And as it continues to progress, it takes a little more knowledge and a little more time when you get to these steps. But I don't think having the community involved in any one of these 10 steps would cause a diluting of the science or anything like that, but it would add richness to whatever the program is, because even when you add a community member who may not know so much about research per se, that person is an expert in, in that person's life. And oftentimes it is what the re that part of their life is what the researcher is involved in. So I don't want anyone to ever be fooled into thinking that if a community is involved in every step that it would dilute the science, it only adds to, to your study. Absolutely, Donald. Thank you. Um, and let's get into it. Let's get into those 10 steps, right? So uh, Faith, do you mind going to the next slide, please? So first, planning it. And I think often, and we've learned this too, I think anyone who maybe has done clinical research and has tried to recruit patients and is low on their num numbers in the beginning, they're like, well, what? this is such a cool study. Why, why aren't we getting in the numbers that we want? Um, and sometimes it's just about like making sure that the way that you are framing your question makes sense to a person who would care about the answer. Uh, so I can think back to a time uh, where we were working with some um, breast cancer oncologists uh, who were designing a clinical trial about two types of radiation therapy. And how do you explain the different types of radiation in a way that makes sense to a person who might be interested in the results of that study? Well, why don't we ask someone? And what was determined, what, and this was how I'd, I can obviously today continue to describe the study, is you think about a spray bottle, right? I actually not didn't mean to bring a prop today, but there you go. But Donald has one too. And you can change the setting to, right, if you think that one type is a spray, so it's go, yeah, it, it mists versus a stream, which is direct. And when you explain that there are these two types of radiation to people, it's like, okay, I get the difference between those two things. Um, and it doesn't, you know, sort of as Donald mentioned, like, you're not dumbing down your research by explaining it and creating common ground where someone might say, that's a really interesting study. I really do want to know the answer to that, or how do I get involved in that type of work? And so, Planning it doesn't mean you have to totally slow down the process or dilute or water down the work that you're trying to do. It's how do you make it important and accessible to everyone who's going to really want to know the answer to the important research that you're doing. And so when we're formulating research questions and study design, by having different voices at the table, they can help you create a shared language that can make a research question more resonant. It can make it more applicable. And you can even come up with ways to be able to talk about it at a dinner party with your friends, uh, if you're so passionate again about the research and the work that you're doing. And so, you know, that's assuming that maybe you are a researcher and you're coming with a question, but sometimes it's important to step even further back and just talking with people like Brian at the Spina Bifida Foundation to find out what topics are important to the people, the members of your organization. 
And then you come up with that list and they said, well, okay, of these, what is the top two that you really want answers to? And how do you frame those questions? And so you can have a really organic conversation. And even if it doesn't lead to a research partnership, just having a strategic planning session to talk about shared and mutual benefit around goals and outcomes and resources can mean that you're building trust and trustworthiness. And I think that's another important point that I want to make sure I that you take away from today's discussion is that every conversation and dialogue and communication can lead to trust and trustworthiness because you're creating shared and common ground. Um, I want to ask, uh, yeah, Tanisha. And one of the things as Hillary was talking about creating trust and trustworthiness is knowing the audience, knowing who your research participants are and understanding that there is some background in some communities, including the African-American community, including communities of, uh, of color, other communities of color, those with uh, languages who may not, whose primary language may not be English even, um, women may have some feelings about research and researchers that have caused them to feel excluded. So as a researcher, that is an important thing to consider when you begin to have these conversations and when you begin to ask these questions, that sometimes people are not as excited about what you are interested in because they have another feeling. And if you're building trust and trustworthiness, that can be um, what causes them to be amenable to participate and also to share. Thanks, Tanisha. Um, I do see we have a couple of hands, so we are going to do more of a dialogue towards the end of this section, but feel free again to put your questions in the chat in the meantime. Uh, I did want to, I see Brian's hand, so Brian, take it away. I just want to add to Tanisha's comments. Um, it's really about understanding the needs of patients or communities, um, especially patients with disabilities, because oftentimes research materials and information are inaccessible so it's really, really important to tailor, tailor the research materials or protocols to the needs of a population or community that you're trying to serve. Um, so it's really, really important to be mindful of that and just be willing to be adaptable, flexible, like I said, receptible and accessible to the needs of the community population that you're trying to serve in throughout the research process. Absolutely. Thanks, Brian. And that does speak to how you create uh, important uh, data collection tools that are accessible, right? You can't conduct your study if you can't have people actually communicate and use the tools that you're trying to put out in the community. And so having people like Brian or Tanisha or Donald who can review the materials and say, hey, this actually can't be read by a screen reader. Um, if you potentially might have vision impaired people who are in, or low vision um, participants in a study. Uh, and then also too, I think going to delivering those solutions, I can say, as someone who's participated in multiple clinical trials, I've never had a single uh, investigator follow up with me about what they learned from the vaccine trials that I participated in. So if we go to the next slide for delivering solutions, um, how do you have your participants um, help to disseminate the research study, and it's not just a research article, right? How do you share things? And it can be as easy as a text message. You don't have to create a whole report of your findings for the people who you're trying to either, again, keep involved in the work that you're doing, who maybe participated as a trial participant. Um, but again, what are some of the small things that can demonstrate the value of the relationship that you've had both with people who advised throughout that research life cycle, as well as the people who uh, participated with their data or biological specimens? Um, and Donald, uh, what, what do you um, want to share about delivering solutions back to the community? Yep, the dissemination of the findings, Hillary, is of the utmost importance. I, I participated in the National Institutes of Health Common Survey for, uh, it was Common Survey 2.0, we're gearing up now for 3.0, but the places that I went to do data collection for 2.0 before I started, trust me, I'm going to come back with the findings because I was talking to some 18 and 19 year olds who maybe didn't have as much as a sixth grade education, but they knew about the Likert scale because over in East Baltimore, they remember sitting on their parents' or grandparents' laps, hearing researchers from Johns Hopkins come and say, 
well, did you strongly agree, agree, or strongly disagree? And they knew the Likert scale before they could even count. They knew about strongly disagree, disagree. They knew that. And it was from us going there, doing those research, doing those studies, but never coming back. You guys never came back that told us how much water, how much lead was actually in the water or how much, you know, never come back with the findings. So it is very important that you come back to hold that trustworthiness, the trust piece that you worked so hard at establishing in the first three parts, you got to come back and give that because that gets them ready for the next study. Absolutely. Brian? Yeah, I just want to add to Donald's comments. Um, as a patient living with spinal bifida myself, I participated in various research studies before, but most of the research studies that I participated, I never really heard back from the organizations that really were conducting these research studies. Uh, to our population, uh, I never heard back from the uh, results or even the, the outcomes that were uh, uh, determined during that study or particular study. So it's really, really important, like Donald said, that that research organizations or researchers uh, present these these uh, solutions or, or results to the population or community that they're, they're, they're serving, because without delivering those solutions or outcomes or results of a research study, you're going to lose trust, uh, for sure. Absolutely going to lose trust uh, um, among patients or community members. Um, is it'll, it'll take time to rebuild that trust. But as I mentioned, um, building trust takes time. And delivering solutions, like Donald said, is really, really critical to determine the next steps for improving health outcomes for a community or population. So I just want to add that. Absolutely. Tanisha? And dissemination should start in the planning phase. So it, it can't just begin when you're towards the end of your study and ready to share some information. Those conversations are important to have and also important to have with the uh, prospective participants because they can tell you the best way to reach them. Um, here, I live in a rural area uh, during COVID, one of the um, of the programs that we worked with was really working with CHWs to disseminate COVID vaccine information and to deal with misinformation. And uh, there were a lot of ideas around the table about how to reach the population. And most of them said, if you don't use WhatsApp, you're never gonna get anyone. Um, and you know, people were like, well, what about Facebook? And what about TikTok? And what about, and they were all saying, no, if you don't use WhatsApp, forget it. Uh, so we can't assume um, and as researchers that we know, and even if it applies on Monday, it may not be the same on Wednesday. So it's very important in that planning phase to be sure that you're having those conversations. Absolutely. Thanks, Tanisha. Jenny, can you bring us home on our 10 steps? Absolutely. And one thing I want to add to all three of my colleagues' uh, statements from the patient's uh, side of research, um, I'm a two-time breast cancer survivor, actually recent of 2022. And I, uh, I live in rural New York and I had to travel to New York City numerous times, um, you know, to Sloan Kettering to get the excellence of care that they are noted for. One thing that was almost a shock to me um, was my oncologist took my information of my breast cancer and he pulled up. They didn't use computer at all until, uh, you know, during my visit, until he pulled up the computer and he pulled up studies of the type of breast cancer that I had. And he showed me where I fit into those studies that other patients had participated in. And I went, I walked out of there in awe. Uh, it was so educational. It gave me the opportunity to see, you know, cancers of, you know, of the big C, right? The bad word that they say, and then you don't hear another thing. But when he started to show me, and not just one, five different studies that were done and where I fit, into that framework of those studies. So that follow through back, we as patients deserve that kind of feedback. 
And I you know I am I I really hope that this is where we go into the near future, near future, because I had not seen that before. Wow. Well, thanks, thanks, Jenny. Jenny. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, thanks, Tanisha, Brian, and Donald. Um, we're going to be talking very quick or very shortly about credible messengers, of which all four of you and really get into the, the thick of, well, how do we actually do this, right? Where do you start when you're trying to build relationships with community? Um, but to wrap us up on our 10-step framework, next slide, please. Um, a couple of really important notes that I think all of uh, today's speakers have talked about. One is transformational change, caring, meeting people where they are, whether that's physically, right, in the communities in which they live, work, and play, um, or health-wise where they are in terms of their own medical journeys, emotionally ready versus not ready for participation. Uh, one of our patients' professors who's been with us for over 10 years often tells the story of it took many months for her to say yes to a meeting with Dr. Mullins because she thought that he was just going to be another one of those researchers helicoptering into the community. But it you know, our team would show up to their health fair events. We would bring coffee and donuts to things. We would touch people's hands, like um, making sure that even if people aren't ready to trust you or to participate in research, that doesn't mean that then you're out of there. It's about building a relationship and building trust. And Donald, I know you're going to have something to say about that one. Go ahead. <laughs> real quick. I'm going to keep it real simple. Just yesterday, just as recent as yesterday, I saw a man land on the, the bench in front of the YMCA in Druid Hill. So as I take a plate of hot food out to him, I ask him, you know, are you ready for treatment, for drug treatment, substance abuse? And he pulled his hood back and said, no, I'm not ready. But is that food for me? I'll take the food. So he knows of the intervention. He knows that it's there, but he's just not ready. He's just not there. And sometimes you could have patients with critical illnesses but they're just not ready to go to dialysis because I saw what happened with my grandfather with dialysis. So I know I need it, but I'm just not ready to have the van come get me three times a week. And so it's, it's that, that give and take and being willing and ready, you know, to meet the patient right there where they are right there. And that empathy piece is very important when it, when it comes to this next part, we're going to talk about. Thanks, Donald. Right. It's about being there, not just for the project and the outcome that you are coming to the table with, but it's about the partnership of those who you want to have this journey with together. Um, and so examples of being there, as you mentioned, coming back to share the results of what you've learned, supporting community activities and events that aren't Maybe they aren't your priority, but they are the priority of the partnership, right? The relationship that you have with community-based organizations. And then introducing partners to your network. And so there are plenty of times, and I think even, you know, Jenny got involved with our work because of a mutual uh, colleague in our network who said you would really enjoy partnering on these different initiatives. Um, next slide, please. And as we mentioned, right, the importance of meaningfulness in that type of partnership. So framing a question so it's understood by all, framing the answer so it is understood by all, and framing it for cultural resonance and appropriateness. Because even if you have a population who participate in your clinical research, there may be others who can benefit from what you found, even if it's not 100% you know, generalizable because every community is different. Every zip code, every neighborhood in Baltimore is different. Next slide, please. And finally, authenticity. And this is where we start talking about credible messengers, um, that you can't just check the box with the 10-step framework. You have to get to know the people that you are interacting with. And it really has been such a joy to be able to hang out with Donald at events here in Baltimore City. Uh, Jenny and I are going to be traveling to Miami to present at a conference together next month. Um, Brian and I have co-presented virtually. And Tanisha has uh, represented the patients program at um, national meetings as as well. And so again, how do you be able to lift each other up um, and share your stories while also ensuring that, you know, the partnership is mutually beneficial? Um, so if you don't mind, I'm actually going to skip two slides, Faith, to credible messengers and community partners. And so some of you might say, some of you, I think in the chat, 
have been doing community-based participatory research or patient-centered outcomes research already. So certainly feel free um, to share some of your highlights of what you've learned from your community partners or different steps that you have found really resonant and rich when you've been doing your work out in the community. Um, I do see uh, a Dr. Duda um, to, uh, I'm happy to take one or two questions now um, and then we'll be able to move through the next section. So. There haven't been any, um, if you do have any questions so far, please put them in the chat. But so okay. far, it's been just a lot of comments and interaction with you guys as the panelists okay. and seconding your ideas. Sure. All right. Um, so then uh, the next question, and I will be interested in hearing in the chat, um, but Donald, Jenny, Tanisha, and Brian, if we go to the next slide, who is a credible messenger? Donald. I think I think that a credible messenger is one with lived experience for the community that or population that you are seeking to engage with. A credible messenger is one who has experience or continue to have experience in that community, has connections with the leaders in that community. That's the faith-based community, you know, faith-based leaders in the community, the sometimes nefarious uh, folks in the community. A credible messenger has to know who those people are. So sometimes when we are doing outreach in Baltimore City, one of the toughest communities in the city, we have to know who the shot callers are, so to speak, on that block. So that when we first come to open our table, we go to that person. You know, we're here, we're going to be here for the day. I understand what you usually do here. And I hear if you remember me, I used to be one who did that with you. However, today I'm going to occupy this space to try to help others like I got some help. And most times, Hillary, they just back up. Donnie, good to see you, man. Proud of you. Keep doing what you're doing. Go ahead, do your thing. You know, there are organizations in Baltimore City that, you know, Early on, I was, you know, saying to my team, we're not working with that organization. Why, Donnie? They on the news. They're doing great work. They got credible messengers. Well, all of their messengers are not credible messengers. They have messengers who still straddle in the fence, one side on the good side, one side on the bad side. I can't gel with those people because history tells me that I come from a place where oftentimes I can be railroaded or gone in a different direction. I have to stay away from those types of people. I have to change people, places, and things at all costs, even if it means that sometimes we can't be partners with with with, a, with everybody. You know, everybody who says they're a credible messenger are not so credible. They can get a message around, but they, you know, not so much. Yeah, thanks, Donald. And Welcome. Sean in the chat, yeah, said, could you say that a credible messenger is in the eye of the beholder? So Brian and then Tanisha, thoughts on uh, credible messengers. Brian. Just to, just to add to Donald's comments, um, to me, credible messengers are patient advocates or staff advocates, community leaders, uh, representatives with relevant experiences who are connected to a patient community or population. Uh, credible messengers are people who really understand the worldview of patients or communities. In other words, walking in patient shoes based upon relevant lived experiences and truly understand the issues and barriers that patient communities or populations tend to face daily to speak and advocate for meaningful changes, including um, healthcare research. So when we look at the 10 state framework, credible messengers can be trustworthy partners for research throughout the process to ensure that research is meaningful, uh, culturally uh, relevant or inclusive and accessible, especially for people with disabilities like myself, and such as making, like I mentioned before, is making those study materials more, uh, more relevant and accessible in electronic format. And this goes beyond, this goes from the planning stages to the uh, dissemination stages of research as well. So. Credible messengers are just people with relevant experiences and really just can be trustworthy partners um, as well. 
Thanks, Brian. Tanisha? And for me, uh, re reiterating what my fellow panelists have said, uh, in my experience, credible messengers are the um, are the people who our target participants go to. Uh, they're the voices that speak to them. They're the ones and the resources that they use the most. Um, so it varies um, and it it really takes a little work to find out who that is uh, and to really in, be sure that you're listening clearly. Uh, because as Donald said, there can be the most obvious messenger, uh, but the most vocal messenger may not be the most credible messenger. And that is uh, the piece that has to really be considered. Who are the, the resources that people go to? And uh, one of the questions in the chat was from uh, Dr. DeCarl about using uh, cognitive interviewing. Uh, again, I live in a rural area. We're sort of a combination. I live on the Eastern shore of Maryland. So I live in the largest city on the Eastern shore, uh, which is comprised of five counties, but uh, we are still considered very rural because most of what happens here is poultry farming. Uh, and what we relied on during uh, COVID and, and during a lot of the research that is now unfolding in our area is um, the incorporation of some task forces and also the engagement of community health workers. Uh, in our community, we have really focused on providing community health workers for various focuses. So for COVID, for vaccination information, for opioid abuse disorder, uh, and those CHWs have been the voices that have helped modify and help to refine messaging. Thanks, Tanisha. Jenny? I'd like to answer the question as well uh, that Dr. James had. Um, the um, patient-centered outcomes research, PCOR, um, was part of our organization, or we were part of that organization, and we were we benefited from a grant um, from the University of Maryland. And we did do patient focus groups. Actually, we still have the patient focus group that we established, and uh, they meet once a month. And we do... Uh, solicit from them feedback, information. They do their own research, provide to us. They interview, um, you know, patient cohorts and groups. Um, we don't have a huge, we have different organizations, very siloed in our rural area. And we don't really have specific community health, um, you know, participants that are out there helping people. We actually, as a team for clinical research department, went right to the farmer's market. Um, by which, where does everybody go to get their vegetables in the summer? That's the only caveat is we have terrible winters, but in the summer, in the spring, in the summer, and the fall, we have wonderful farmer's market. So we're right there with the patients and we are doing, you know, cognitive interviewing. Um, they don't realize it, however we are. And um, we find that very beneficial along with our focus group. Thank you for the question. Cool. Thanks, yeah, Jim. I like that. Yeah. Go ahead, Donald. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that question about the cognitive interviewing because we use motivational interviewing and we were trained with that with the CHW certification. But when you talk about the CI, I think that, and especially to what uh, James said, where it helped to frame if they even understood the language in some of the questions and the fact that 30 to 50%, you know, did that was, that's something great. And I feel good that I get, I'm the one who gets to bring that back to my team and say, Hey guys, let's look at this CI because sometimes as, as a patient professor and I'm working for the Johns Hopkins. So it's very intimidating for me, a guy from Baltimore who knows the reputation of Johns Hopkins, the good and the bad. And now you know, I have community members who say, oh, you're too Johns Hopkins. And then I have some folks in Johns Hopkins that says, oh, he's just a little bit too community for me. So, you know, it's it's a very thin line. And sometimes it is like working on a tightrope with uh, no safety net. Thanks, Donald. Um, so to wrap up uh, just our portion of the presentation so we can get to Q&A, um, even though we've started taking a couple of those questions, if you don't mind, Faith, going up to the research adaptability slide, I think it's about four slides ahead. Um, so again, it's really important, as we've mentioned, that 
to change research based on community feedback. And that that feedback can be in different ways. It could be through cognitive interviewing. It could be through motivational interviewing. It could be meeting people at the farmer's market, but being open to listening and asking curious questions means that, that you're, again, getting the voices of the people who in the, you know, not even in the end, but just continuously can engage with you to make your research better. Um, and how, you know, thinking about how adaptable is your research plan beyond what you might have to submit in an IRB modification, but how adaptable are you to the changing times and meeting, again, the community partners where they are, community-based organizations as where they are, uh, because things happen, right? COVID happened and many of us didn't expect that. Um, and Tanisha, I'll get to you in one second. Let me just finish these three slides. Um, if you don't mind going next slide, Faith. And so, you know, it's important that when you are, you know, either meeting with credible messengers that you've identified or patient partners or even your research team, uh, discussing the value of collaboration between researchers and communities, right? Part of it means that we have to be champions and advocates within our institutions to begin reaching out um, to start those conversations with potential partners and community-based organizations. And to highlight the importance of bi-directional communication for beneficial research. I learn every day what makes the work we do better because people like Brian, Jenny, Tanisha, and Donald tell us not only the good things that we've done, but also when things didn't go as well as we had hoped they would, right? If we gave an article that really didn't hit the mark for what we were trying to achieve in our conversation, I want to know how we can improve. And I love that we've built the partnership where my ego is not fragile as a researcher and that I can be told how to improve the work that I do in order to be a better partner with my community-based organizations. And that the call to action is to strive to make research more beneficial, relevant, and adaptable to community needs. That's what we want to do, right? It's not just to get myself a research grant. It's to make sure that the work that we're doing can really impact lives, especially when we're doing things in healthcare and health services research. Um, next slide, please. So I hope that through today's presentation and through the conversations and the voices that have been shared, that you've been able to learn how credible messengers can help identify the importance of research and how it can benefit communities, how credible messengers can play roles in determining the benefits of community conversations. Um, and we haven't talked about this, and Tanisha, maybe this is where you're going to go, or you can talk about this as well as you know, what happens when research isn't actually beneficial from a community's perspective? And how do you move forward in partnership with that? Um, more to come. We have a, a second part of this webinar next month, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But I do want to leave some time for our Q&A. Um, so, uh, Tanisha, do you mind? I saw you had your raised hand. So sharing your thoughts, and then we'll open it up to our uh, participants in today's webinar. Yes, one quick uh, thing that uh, both Jenny and Hillary brought up that I want to remind everyone is be sure not to uh, continue to reinvent the wheel. Um, as Jenny said, they still have their focus group. Um, in our area, we still have the task force that began during COVID uh, and the relationships are strong and it has really made a change in public health and research in our community. Thanks, Tanisha. So Faith, if you don't mind just going to the concluding thoughts, or excuse me, concluding thoughts slide. Um, and then I know that uh, Tapati has had their hand raised for a long time. So Tapati, I would love to hear your thoughts, reactions, questions um, to today's webinar. Yeah, just to note, um, participants can't come off a of mute. So okay. we, you'd have to put that question in the chat. Um, so hopefully uh, you're able to, to put that into words so we can read it out to our panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Faith. Sorry about that. Um, and then I think, Faith, this question uh, is geared for you about the credit. Yes, this is the um, survey link for the CE credit. It is for Chess and Chess. So please complete that. Even if you're not looking for a uh, continuing education credit, we'd love to hear back from you so that we can, again, continue to make our webinars good for you as well. Thanks, Faith. Uh, great question in the chat. So uh, whoever wants to go first, partnerships are key. What recommendation would you give for uh, getting started in building partnerships with community and connect with researchers? How can libraries help with building these relationships and partnerships? Thanks, Tanisha. Uh 
Our library took on such an amazing role during COVID uh, from adapting uh, some of the services that they provided to really supporting all of the organizations and sort of serving as a hub. So I think that the biggest thing that the library can do is assess what their what needs are, are and where the gaps are and to go in and have conversations and ask, what can we do to help foster the things that that um, are needed in our community. So it is a lot of what librarians do, doing the research. Jenny? And I just wanted to to read a question. I did get a the comment from Tapai. Oh, yeah, okay. uh, the comment was here is that uh, they just wanted to mention that it, this is not a linear process. So mm -hmm. just kind of reiterating what you guys said earlier about revisiting it through different parts of the actual building process and that it doesn't occur just linear. Absolutely. And that also yeah. trust building is often associated with intergenerational process with certain communities. So, and also uh, deeply seated intergenerational traumas as well. Absolutely. Jenny. Um, so we did a gap analysis to start with. And interestingly enough, our research department is part of a big, well, big hospital system for our area. Um, and uh, we have three hospitals within our um, system and the, the results were surprising. Um, many of our employees didn't know we had a clinical research team. Um, so that was a shocker. Um, so we had to really go back to basics. We used the 10 step framework to communicate who we were and what we do and educate our peers within the hospital system. Um, and that included providers as well. And then at the same time, in parallel to that, we were communicating with the community. And, and we did a huge marketing plan. We actually have billboards up in each of the small uh, rural towns that are within our um, informational articles through our local newspaper, PSAs, you know, public service announcements. And the big thing that was the big hit was the farmer's market, um, believe it or not. And the people there loved it. And, you know, it was a very, it was just eye opening. And, you know, the 10 step framework helped us put that together. Yes, we had to go back to steps. Like, um, you know, uh, it was mentioned. Um, it's not linear. It's very fluid. And it's, um, it's, it goes in all directions. And our patient focus group, again, I cannot reiterate, build a group. They are very helpful in giving a voice. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. And thanks for those um, participating in the chat. Uh, as we get into these last couple of minutes, I wanted to see if Donald, Brian, or Tanisha have any concluding thoughts uh, before we turn it back to Faith to, to wrap us up. Brian? I, do have some, I do have some concluding thoughts. Um, I do want to mention that um, the libraries um, can also be a, a resource for the similar results of a research study. Uh, I think it's really important that libraries do partnership with a lot of organizations, especially uh, organizations that serve people with disabilities, like myself. Um, I often, when I go to a library, I don't see a lot of accessibility uh, materials uh, being presented there, like in Braille or large print or uh, electronic digital format. So I think it's important that the uh, libraries get engaged and partner with organizations that that serve people with disabilities. So I think it's really, really important, especially for research um, as well. So uh, today's webinar was really, um, hopefully that it was really, really empowering for all participants. And I hope that they learned something as much as I learned myself from my, from my fellow colleagues here and you, Hillary, as well. So um, I felt really empowering, but I also want to say that it's really about empowering patients' voices because it's really about the lives of patients and communities that are only served um, in healthcare research. So I just wanted to add to that. Thank you. Thanks, Brian.
Great. Thank you all. I'll leave with this parting because I know we're uh, basically at time. But again, thank you all so much for coming and just sharing your perspectives. Thanks for everybody who actually, you know, came to this webinar and its interest. I know that it would have been um, wonderful if we could have taken people off mute and participated, but um, most of our format is kind of outward in this way. So you may get emails from other people having them do this version for you where it can be a little bit more participatory. Um, I just want to remind everybody again about the uh, survey evaluation link in the chat. And also, if you can join us for part two, um, if you didn't participate in part one or you came in late, that's fine. It's not necessarily predicated for you to participate in part two. It's going to occur um, at 1 p.m. on February 27th. I've also put the link in. And when we finish the recording, we'll be sending out the recording link and the slides. So if you missed it and you want to catch more of it or just have a replay, you'll have that option to do so. Again, thank you so much. Hillary's put the patient's information in here. Because Hillary, people can participate outside of the Maryland community, correct, Baltimore? Absolutely. Yeah. Whether it's, uh, again, many of our members on the call today are from across the U.S. Uh, and we have um, patients, professors in many states as well as some countries. So please feel free to reach out if you're interested in speaking with some of our patients, professors. You can use that email address as well, and we can direct uh, your inquiries to them as appropriate. So thanks again, everyone, for uh, being part of today's presentation. And Faith, thank you so much for having all of us. Uh, really appreciated the time today. Thank you Thank all. Thank you all. And